So good afternoon and welcome to the second of two talks by the uh, 2012 Rotman Institute lecturer, who is Professor Nancy Cartwright. Um, the talk today is called Wiser Use of Social Science, Wiser Wishes, Wiser Policies. Uh, Nancy Cartwright is perhaps the uh, one of the most influential, most original, best known philosophies of science for you today. She holds, as Charles Bader mentioned yesterday, two academic positions. She uh, spends most of her time at LSE, and then very wisely, in the coldest months of the winter, she goes to uh, San Diego and uh, spends three months there. It would take very much too long to run through a list of all the awards and honors and positions that uh, Nancy has received. Uh, and similarly for her publications. She's worked on a vast variety of topics, including philosophy of physics, philosophy of economics, uh, theories of evidence, modeling, and perhaps most notoriously, she has questioned the empiricist understanding of laws of nature and bravely suggested that we reintroduce some such causality, perhaps causal factors, into our accounts of science. As you know, her most recent work deals with science policy. And at least for me, uh, what's the best feature of her work is that this is nothing that's at all separate from her work in technical yeah. philosophy of science. So instead, she mobilizes the resources of technical philosophy of science to try to make a better, more equitable world. And it's the fact that these two things go together so intimately in Nancy's work that I think makes her a particularly appropriate Rotman lecturer. Mm -hmm. So um, we have with us today not just the people in this room, but of course the people who are watching online. So for those of you who are watching live online, you'll have a chance to ask questions during the discussion period. You just type in your questions, somebody will read it, and you'll be able to hear Professor Cartwright's answer. So I hope those of you who are watching online and the people in the room here will welcome me and uh, join me in welcoming Nancy back to Western. Thank you. Well, let me, <coughs> let me repeat for people who weren't here yesterday uh, what an honor it is and pleasure uh, to be at Western again, and particularly to be talking at the Rockman Center uh, because I have a long standing interest in science and values and how um, science can help us um, make a better world. And um, I think the work here at the Institute is um, really important in this direction. Let me begin um, on wiser use of social science. In 2004, in the London Borough of Herring Day, 17-month-old Peter Connolly was found dead in his crib. The child had suffered fractured ribs and a broken back after months of abuse at home. His mother, her partner, and a lodger were jailed for his death. Peter had been seen by health and social service professionals at Comparing Gate Council 60 times in the eight months before he died. There were two kinds of government responses that I shall discuss. First, the Minister of Education, Ed Balls, sacked the Director of Children's Services in Herring Bay, Sharon Schuster, he sat with an immediate appeal in a live press conference on television. And as you see here, she has since won a court of appeals battle against the dismissal on the grounds of undue unfair procedures, and she's not been allowed to present her case. Ms. Shoesmith defended herself and her service. I'm quoting, we should not be put into blame. It does not produce anything productive and obscures the bigger picture. An early BBC News interviewer argued to the contrary, and I'm quoting him, if nobody accepts the blame, how can we stop this happening again? A second response was, from, was that of then Prime Minister Tony Blair. He argued that the government can make children more safe by identifying at-risk families and intervening early on behalf of the children. Let me summarize, this is a quote from Blair, let me summarize my argument. I'm not talking about trying to make the state raise children or interfering with normal family life. I am saying that where it is clear, as it very often is, at young age, <coughs> children are... Sorry. 
bit of a blip in my uh, up inserted something. <laughs> At risk of being brought up in a dysfunctional home where there are multiple problems, say of drug abuse or offending, then instead of waiting until the child goes off the rails, we should act early enough with the right help, support, and discipline framework for the family to prevent it. It may be the only way to save them and the wider community from the consequences of inaction. According to Blair, we can predict, we can then intervene. Now, both these uh, responses are morally questionable. Look first at Blair's. Blair's program is intended to identify at-risk families and offer help. But there seems to be evidence that labeling families at risk can increase the anxiety of the parent and thereby increase the likelihood of abuse or neglect. Also, as other experts report, and I'm quoting, parents who have been through the process of child protection investigations <coughs> and registration are often bruised and stigmatized by the experience and wary of accepting the help or support which may follow. So the program may cause harm overall. Also, the question of parents' rights and family autonomy looms. As the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy puts it, Parents have moral and legal rights regarding their children. They have the liberty to make decisions on behalf of their children regarding matters such as diet, schooling, and association with others. Also, others argue, the government acts as paternalistically when it aims to take over or control, I'm quoting the game, properly what is within the individual's own legitimate domain of action or judgment. That's another advocate of parents' rights. In giving directions to parents, the government substitutes its judgment of how to raise their children in place of the parent's judgment. So, all this considered, even if the interventions will produce the predicted benefits, there remains a question about whether such interventions are justified. As to blame, okay. <coughs> blame is retributive, it is often vindictive. It attacks the moral character of the culprit, not the deed. Um, and as Garrett Williams explains, there's clear evidence from social psychology that blame is frequently and inappropriately attributed to the free choices of the individuals, tending to, quote, overestimate the extent to which people's behavior is due to internal dispositional factors and underestimate the role of situational factors. Blaming a person is more than grading them negatively. It is, as Jay Wallace argues, to make them the object of negative emotions, resentment, indignation, and subject to adverse treatment, avoidance, reproach, scolding, denunciation, remonstration, and punishment. And let's see what this looks like. Well, clearly, I'm relieved with the judgment. Um, but when I actually read the judgment itself, and read what the judges have said, I feel, um, you know, very much that they have identified, they have recognised what it was I was living through during those few weeks, in that they, they are very clear that I was so good, uh, and that's clearly what I was experiencing. So there's some um, comfort in it uh, when I read that judgment today, but it is always um, with the uh, knowledge that all of this started with the looking at the little boy. Um, so it can never be a moment of celebration, really. Um, what impact has it had on you and your family over these last two and a half years? Well, it instantly wiped away the life that I knew. Um, it instantly wiped away many of my adventure groups, for example. Mm. Um, it wiped away my livelihood. And it absolutely brought my career to an instant halt. Um, so I've been unemployed and unemployable. Did you find, because many people think it was very personal, there wasn't a, a vilification, if you like, the word that's being used. How was it on the receiving end of that? It was horrific. It was frightening. I was, I was terrified. Um, I had death threats. I mean, of course, I was, I was afraid on the streets of London. Um, and it wasn't just me and my imagination. You know, uh, the police were uh, advising me you know, that I was probably at risk. And when people begin to take photographs of you on the trains, on buses, and um, point you out and, and, and you know, start to shout, that's that woman. Um, it's, you're fearful uh, of where that can go. But when you look... That's 
Sorry, maybe I should wait for that one. So two reactions. Uh, Blair's early intervention proposals and Ed Balls and the BBC interviewers, the first interviewer, not this one, um, the B uh, Ed Balls and the BBC interviewers public blame of children's services director. This may or may not all told be morally acceptable. My concern uh, here is to hack away some mistaken philosophical stances that prop them up, stances that are currently widely adopted in policy analysis from child welfare to crime to education to economic development. These involve a circle of ideas about, uh, well, different uh, order here, uh, about certainty, objectivity, and causality. Causality matters because policy analysis focuses on prediction. Goodness. Better be careful here. <coughs> the uh, slides in my uh, text don't quite line up. Like <laughs> <laughs> policy matters because policy analysis focuses on prediction. What will these actions produce if implemented? And on evaluation. What did the actions under scrutiny resemble? <coughs> here are the three Surely. Mm -hmm. okay. We'll have to go back to that, I think. Okay. Causality matters to prediction. What will these actions produce if implemented? Evaluation. What did the actions under scrutiny result in? Uh, and here are the three mutually supporting stances that I worry about. Okay. First, we bank on certainty. Second, we suppose objectivity is the path to certainty, where objectivity is equivalent in this context to eliminating the subject, especially judgment, and the use of methods that have manuals that fix correct procedures. And the third is, we assume that causality is linear and that it is God-given. There is a vigorous, I discussed this yesterday, but I'm going to try and give a self-contained talk today. There is a vigorous, increasingly influential movement championing objectivity and certainty in social policy and social deliberation. It insists that for policy evaluation and prediction, we rely only on methods like randomized controlled trials, or RCTs, uh, that can provide certainty. In the, ideal RC, in the ideal, RCTs can clinch causal claims, and they can do so without the intrusion, so it is said, of subjective judgment. And then from this position, we slide, there you see, to this, the, I've got them out of order. Sorry, uh, am I going to get, yes, from this position, <laughs> we slide easily. Um, okay, that's what I was supposed to do. Into our third problematic assumption that causality is linear and God given. Look at linear first. The slide is easy. And easy not the, the side. The slide from looking for objectivity and certainty um, is easy into I, I, into thinking that causality is linear and God given. That slide is easy and easy not to notice. That's because through the lens of RCTs, complex causal webs get projected onto a line. And here's the picture. Okay, now I've got it. Sorry. There's the picture uh, of um, the causal process as RCTs uh, suggested. There are two different senses of linear involved in this image, and we tend to suppose both. Yesterday, I talked about helping factors. What we label the cause is seldom enough on its own to produce the effect. It needs help. Without the whole team of support factors acting together, no contribution to the effect will result. Um, now, here is a cake of contributing of uh, ingredients, all of which need to be present at once, uh, for some typical um, unhappy child welfare outcomes. The cake diagrams make vivid a crucial point, but they also make it look too simple. For most policies, the connection between cause and effect is not immediate. There's a long chain of steps in between, and each has to occur at the appropriate time to lead on to the next. Consider this diagram for the nurse-family partnership. Already this picture is more complicated than my simple domino image, 
since the policy does not initiate just a single causal chain, but we've got three um, different policy actions that are to lead by interwoven chains of intermediate effects to targeted outcomes. In this case, less child abuse and fewer young people arrested. Focus um, on <coughs> the bottom line, though. That's the bottom line. I'm sorry you can't read it very well. What really matters is to see the structure. Um, focus on the bottom line, which looks like a straightforward linear sequence. To describe it thus is to miss the point about helping factors. What we picture is the cause typically cannot produce the effect on its own, but needs the help of a whole team of support factors. That's going to be true at each step in the causal sequence. There's not just one causal cake here, but a different causal cake for each step. We want then to talk about the helping factors necessary for the if, if we want then to talk about the helping factors necessary for the initial nurse family partnership causes to produce the final targeted outcomes, we have to gather together all the members of all the support teams from each stage and graph them together in one huge causal cake. The point about causal cakes is that all their ingredients have to be in place or you don't get the suggested level of the effect. To the extent that any of these ingredients is uncertain, so too is the final outcome. But look at our circle of problems. We bargain for certainty. The simple linear causal model makes this look a far better bargain than it generally is. So we often expect results that can't be achieved, which leads to wasted money and effort, and to heartbreak and dashed hopes. We don't work to put in place support factors that can help make our policies work because we haven't noticed the need for them. We blame perfectly good policies for failing that could achieve better results in better <coughs> circumstances if only we put in place the helping factors. And we despair of doing anything because we cannot find the miracle cure. The linear model and the emission of support factors also predisposes us to focus efforts on eliminating, on eliminating harmful causes at the head of the sequence, like family drug and alcohol abuse, which can be a tall order. But it can be just as effective to remove support factors anywhere, remove support factors, and to remove them anywhere in the causal chain. Consider the growing body of research on resilience factors. Resilience describes the product of a combination of mechanisms for coping in the face of adversity. Evidence from longitudinal studies suggests that a large proportion of children recover from short-lived childhood adversities with little detectable impact in adult life. Encouraging resilience is important because resilient children uh, seem to be better equipped to resist stress and adversity, to cope with change and uncertainty, and to recover faster and more completely from traumatic events or episodes. And so that's about uh, linearity um, in the sense of uh, just picturing one cause after another. Uh, there's another fact, and remember I said there were two features uh, of linearity that matter. The second is that linear models don't have cycles in them, but cycles can matter. Consider the UK's recent Monroe Review of Child Protection. Um, all this uh, work comes from a joint project I have with the author of the review, uh, I know Monroe. So, um, the review notes that policies, even good ones, can figure in negative takes alongside positive ones. The negative takes diminish the good effects of the policy and can even, if they are strong enough, outweigh the good effects. You can sometimes unearth the negative effects by thinking, thinking through the causal process from beginning to end, step by step, as I just recommended in hunting for the full panoply of support factors. This kind of step-by-step -step review can be particularly important if any of the causal stages in between are self-reinforcing, so that the outcomes, negative or positive, escalate over time. This is just the trouble that the Monroe Review can pinpoints for one of the big UK child welfare policies. The policy was intended to improve welfare outcomes by providing stricter guidelines for what social workers must do in dealing with children and families, and by better monitoring what they are doing, by ensuring that specific <coughs> mandated facts 
about the family and the child are ascertained and reported properly, and that all required meetings take place. But this policy, the review argues, can have serious negative effects alongside the intended positive one. How so? Through various negative feedback loops. Have a look at this diagram from the review. So that's, that's a diagram from the review uh, constructed by our LSE colleague David Lehman. Two negative loops are pictured, R1 and R2. Both start in the same, same way, increasing the amount of prescription imposed on social workers reduces their sense of satisfaction and self-esteem. In R1, so there's R1, this increases staff sickness and absence rates. In R2, in R2 it increases staff turnover rates. Both these effects tend to result in increase in average social worker caseload, which leads to social workers spending less time with the children and their families. This, in turn, reduces the quality of the social workers' relationships with the children and their families, which then reduces the quality of the outcomes. So, the policy may produce bad intended outcomes, bad unintended consequences. Worse, these negative effects can become amplified by the feedback loops. When the outcomes are regularly too unsatisfactory, this reduces social work welfare's sense of self-esteem and personal responsibility and the negative cycle is set in motion again. Besides the habit of taking causality as linear in both these senses, we also take it to be God-given. But the kinds of causal principles we rely on for policy predictions are not God-given. They depend on intricate underlying structures. And our focus on objectivity and certainty takes our attention away from these underlying structures. Now, to make this point vivid, I use an example not from social policy, but from my own daily policies. I write my lectures on paper and with a sharp pencil. I sharpen my pencils by putting a kite outside my study window. I can do that because my study was designed by Ruth Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> putting a kite out the window is a very effective policy for me to get nice, sharp pencils. Still, I don't advise you to fly <coughs> a kite to sharpen your pencils. Kite flying undoubtedly figures in the causal principles that govern pencil sharpening in my study. It would, for instance, pass any number of rigorous RCTs. But that principle is local. It depends on the underlying structure of my study. The causal role played by kite flying in my study is not God-given depends on a complex pattern of interactions in an intricate underlying structure. Here's another case, a familiar regularity, Kepler's laws describing the elliptical orbit of a planet. <clears throat> and here is the well-known underlying structure that gives rise to it. <clears throat> of course, these are not typical social policy cases. Social policies suppose principles like Burnout causes turnover in child welfare service workers, or age does not, or apathetic futile mothers are more likely to maltreat their children. These are clearly not God-given either, and surely it is implausible to suppose that getting a good social regularity, as these are purported to be, depends <coughs> less on the details of the underlying structure than getting regularities between pure physical quantities. Now, no two that I am not supposing that there are no human universals, that people in Bangladesh villages are essentially different from those in New York high-rises, nor across the 300 language groups and more than 50 non-indigenous communities who live in London. In fact, my two non-social examples of local causal principles work in just the opposite way, by relying on other causal principles that hold widely. My pencil sharpener depends on a number of fairly universal principles, mm -hmm. from the laws of the lever and the pulley to the familiar fact that moths eat flannel. They, it depends on that to ensure that the arrangement and interaction of the components results in the causal principle I use to sharpen my pencils. So the fact, if it is one, 
that there are a large number of universal truths about human behaviors, emotions, and reactions, goes no way to showing that the kinds of causal principles that we rely on in typical social policies will be anything other than their local. Our aspirations for certainty divert our attention to these kinds of local causal principles since they are the ones we can nail down with objective methods, like RCTs, flying kites in Nancy's study sharpens pencils. That's a local causal principle. Or um, from the MIT-based uh, General Poverty Action Lab, JPAL, there's another word, informing villagers in certain Indian villages of poor teaching in their villages and raising awareness of accountability mechanisms had no impact on teacher attendance. Our efforts are taken away from the more difficult study of the underlying structures that make these causal principles <coughs> possible. Well, building and justifying models of these structures is like building and justifying theories. It's hard. We must devise, appro we must devise appropriate theoretical concepts with serious detailed content, defend them, and show that they are applicable to the case. We require a large number of interlocking hypotheses, none of which is appropriately tested in isolation. And we must balance a plethora of epistemic virtues with which, okay, and these virtues can conflict with each other, as we know, and are each highly contested. So, um, here's an example uh, from uh, ordinary, my ordinary class teaching of um, a, 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 a contested list of epistemic virtues that must be balanced if we're going to um, settle on uh, models of the underlying structure or one theory. There is no rule book for how to do this. And the results will always be, to some extent, controversial. That is the condition we must learn to live with. And not, like Tony Blair, suppose that we can know. We can predict. The things we really need to know are not easy to figure out. And we necessarily make mistakes. As Ernie McMullen taught, there's Ernie, uh, second from the right, second, anyway, second from this slide, um, uh, as Ernan McMullen taught, controversy far from being rare and wrong-headed is a persistent and pervasive <coughs> presence in science at all levels. So too in serious social policy. Now when it comes not to prediction but to evaluation, looking back to see what was responsible for outcomes, the focus on linear causal principles with their objective certifying methods leads to skewed views about human error and individual responsibility. As Eileen Monroe uh, of the Monroe Review explains elsewhere, uh, <clears throat> when a tragedy like the death of Peter Connolly occurs, the standard response is to hold an inquiry, looking in detail at the case, <coughs> trying to get a picture of the causal sequence of events that ended in a child's death. We are tracing a chain of events back in time to understand how it happened. More. Unlike the police investigation, which focuses on the perpetrators of the homicide, these inquiries focus primarily on how the professionals acted, judging them against the formal procedures for working with families and principles of good practice. Where does this backwards tracing stop? As Monroe argues, and I'm quoting her, the events that, are, that bring the investigation to a halt usually take the form of human error. Practitioners did not comply with procedures or lack of accepted standards of good practice. But as the UK Department of Health explains, and I'm quoting from them, there are two ways of viewing human error, a person-centered approach and a systems approach. The former, the person-centered approach, focuses on the psychological precursors of error, such as inattention, forgetfulness, and carelessness. Its associated countermeasures are aimed at individuals rather than situations, and these invariably fall within the control paradigm of management. Such controls include disciplinary measures, writing more procedures as to guide individual behavior, or blaming, naming, and shaming, as we saw at the start with Ed Balls and the first BBC interview. But as the Department of Health notes, aside from treating errors as moral issues, the person-centered approach isolates unsafe facts from their context, thus making it very hard to uncover and eliminate recurrent error traps within the system. The systems approach, in contrast, 
takes a holistic stance on the issues of mm -hmm. work failure. It recognizes that many of the problems facing organizations are complex, ill-defined, and, and result from the interaction of a number of factors. Now, the same worry is studied in the U.S. National Academy of Sciences pamphlet to Air as Human, Building a Safer Health System. And I'm quoting from them. The title of this report encapsulates its purpose. Human beings in all lines of work make errors. Errors can be prevented by designing systems that make it hard for people to do the wrong thing and easy for people to do the right thing. Cars are designed so that drivers cannot starve them while in reverse because that prevents accidents. Work schedules for pilots are designed so they don't fly too many consecutive hours without, real, without rest because alertness and performance are com compromised. The, NA the NAS report urges, and I'm quoting again, the focus must shift from blaming individuals for past errors to a focus on preventing future errors by designing safety in the system. Or, to put it in the terms I have been using, we should be less concerned with the easier to certify causal sequences that start with human error and end with disastrous consequences, and far more with understanding and restructuring the underlying structures that make this kind of causal sequence likely. As Eileen Monroe notes, when a society is shocked and outraged by a child's terrible tale of suffering, there seems a basic human desire to find a culprit, someone to bear the guilt for the disaster, and to be the target of feelings of rage and frustration. This puts us, puts us squarely into the business of finding these local linear causal principles, and with Tony Blair, we can feel morally and epistemically safe in doing so. We are not likely to pass the blame in the wrong places, because these are the kinds of claims about which, with due care, our objective methods can deliver reasonable certainty. But the kinds of preventive measures this leads to, we call the Department of Health's examples. Disciplinary actions, writing more procedures to guide individual behavior, or blaming, naming, and shaming. These kinds of preventative measures are often unlikely to stop these kinds of sequences occurring. As Monroe urges, child protection is a systems problem. And so are a good many other social problems, from poor childhood nutrition in Bangladesh, and poor school attendance by teachers in Indian villages, to crime, education, health, and climate change adaptation almost anywhere. <clears throat> our thirst for certainty and our admiration for methods that can be put, run by rules must not lead us to buy cheap knowledge that can't serve our needs. Now, my final worry about trusting that good objective methods can deliver high degrees of certainty is that we very often don't know what we are testing with these methods. This is a topic that came up in conversation at the end of last lecture. In one sense, we do. We know all too well, and that is the problem. Our best objective methods for testing causal claims social science, like randomized controlled trials, require a precise characterization of both the cause and the effect. This is a crucial part of the study protocol. We must ensure that everyone in the treatment group gets the same treatment, and everyone in the control group gets the same placebo, um, and that there are strict criteria for deciding whether the effect has occurred. Otherwise, the validity of the conclusion is impugned. This in turn means that treatment and effect descriptions are couched in concrete operational terms. There's the rub. For policy prediction, we need those principles that hold widely, at least widely enough to travel from the study situation to the target situation. But these kinds of principles often relate not concrete concepts of the kind operationalized in a good study, but far more abstract ones. Now, to avoid I have some social examples, but to avoid getting into um, controversy about any specific social case, let me illustrate with a clear example from physics. The little people living on this sphere are studying how by actually they're big people compared to spheres. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the big yeah. people living on this little sphere um, are studying how bodies move when they are subject to no forces. They conclude. Only subject to no forces move in great circles, because they're living on a sphere. And they were right for their own local circumstances. But that, what they record will not help people living here 
on a Euclidean plane, nor here. Neither of these. The tragedy is that the people living on a sphere have actually tested a useful, wide-ranging principle. That's the principle that bodies subject to no forces move on straight lines, or the shortest distance between two points. They need a better theory, but there's no rule to find it. This kind of problem looms even larger for social policy because the same thing doesn't mean the same in different social settings. Or mean, doesn't always mean the same in different social settings. Consider another case from UK child welfare policy. Not one that we currently have strong evidence for, but where there seems cause to worry. In many cases, a child's caregivers, well, they're not legally compelled, they're encouraged, perhaps badgered is a better word, into attending parenting classes. And this includes fathers. But what constitutes a father? Is father instantiated by biological <coughs> father, or, for example, a male partner of the mother who lives in the household with a child, or maybe male caregiver? Maybe the policy will be effective if the male caregivers or men living with the mother are targeted, but not biological fathers. If so, to focus on being a father would lead to move too, to too high a level of abstraction, since only the more specific feature, male caregiver or male partner of another of mother who shares the child's household, enters into a reasonably reliable principle. On the other hand, compelling the father or male caregiver to attend classes can be too concrete. Different cultures in the UK have widely different views about the roles fathers should play in parenting. Compelling fathers to attend classes can <coughs> fall under the more abstract description, ensuring caregivers are better informed about ways to help the child, in which case it could be expected to be positively effective for improving the child's welfare. But it may also instantiate the more abstract feature, public humiliation, in which case it could act oppositely. And of course, it can fall under both at once. In any case, if the two more abstract features fall in opposite directions, there will be no reliable principle to formulate at the more concrete level involving fathers. My how are we doing for time? Oh, okay, well, then I'll just, um, uh, nor is this pull um, in opposite directions. This story is one we worry about, but we don't know what's happening. But the pull in opposite directions isn't an unrealistic hypothesis. We know from empirical research that there are varying outcomes associated with compelling parents to attend parenting classes, and also that these are correlated with varying motivations. What's unfortunate is we don't have sufficient theoretical probing to explain the variations and the correlations. Um, we don't have enough arguments to tell us what should follow from this. Now, my concluding remarks uh, focus on how readily we manage to avert our gaze from the issues I have raised. And some of the points will be once more than from yesterday and some new. For purposes of thinking about policy prediction and evaluation, it is important to distinguish three distinct kinds of causal claims. First, it works somewhere, and this is the kind of claim we can clinch with objective methods like RCTs. It's the kind of verdict that a good post of evaluation can deliver. The second, kind of, uh, second distinct kind of causal claim, it works. I take it that this, it, this very popular expression must mean something like it works almost everywhere, or at least widely, or perhaps everywhere other things being equal. And thirdly, it will work here. And this is what we want to know when we deliberate about whether to adopt a policy. One is, of course, no guarantee of application for three. Now, my topic here has been with predicting policy outcomes. What will happen if we implement the proposed policy here? From what I've argued, we can extract three kinds of facts that must be in place if claims like one are to provide evidence of that. So the first is, um, and this we saw yesterday, the causal principles that govern the outcome of the study must be the same as those here. Otherwise, what we learn about these principles in the study 
isn't relevant to what happens here. And what we and, and further though, what we did not discuss yesterday, the whether the principles are the same will generally depend on whether the underlying social structures that give rise to them are the same. Now, secondly, uh, again as we saw yesterday, there must be a good distribution of the support factors for the policy here. And then third, again something uh, that we did not see yesterday, the policy variable, oh, sorry, they're not clicking properly. Third, um, the, <coughs> what I've just discussed here today, the policy variables here must instantiate the concepts that figure in the causal principles shared in the study. It's no good sending fathers to parenting classes here if these don't function as learning opportunities here, but only as sources of humiliation. Now you may think that my distinctions are obvious and ones that we are not likely to lose sight of in policy and deliberation, but not so. Consider a paper by um, Duflo and Kramer, who, um, both of whom are brilliant and dedicated development economists at the heart of this MIT-centered uh, uh, Jamio Poverty Action Lab, and their avid, avid advocates of RCTs. Already in line five of their paper, in one single sentence, all three kinds of claims are mixed together. So we see here, the benefits of knowing which programs work extend far beyond any program or agency. Incredible impact evaluations can offer reliable guidance to international organizations. I take it from the language and use that they mean which programs work equal, it works in general, impact evaluation, that just is showing that it works somewhere, and reliable guidance looks like it will work here for us. So here Duflo and Kramer seamlessly slide between it works there, it works, and it will work here. That's loose talk. And loose talk in proper academic settings where we were meant to subscribe to high scientific standards. Exactly the same kind of slide occurs from <coughs> evidence-based policy. This will be familiar um, somewhat from yesterday. To get policies that work here, we are urged to use policies that work. Well, that's okay. Supposing it works means it works generally. If a policy does work in general, in particular widely enough to cover here, then trivially it works here. The trouble is that the standards for it works are not those for establishing a solid general claim and one using the concepts of the policy description. The standards are generally just that the policy, as described in the study protocol, has been shown to work in some study or for highly ranked policy, uh, policy, <coughs> policies um, in a handful of studies. This is exactly what we see in M.P. Graham Allen's report. So we're going to look at the table of contents here. Um, so this is again about um, child, British child welfare policy. Uh, you see Graham Allen, um, what, what Allen has to say under the title of New Rigor. So there's early intervention. Sorry. Oh, sorry, you've got the table of contents there. I have a separate thing. Um, here's what uh, Allen has to say under the title A New Rigor. One of my. Did you, were you able to see here that it says, chapter 6, a new methodology, right? um, robust evidence, and <coughs> using what works? That's what circled there in the red. So what works, that's the point. Okay. And here's what Alan has to say under his title, A New Ritter. One of my, one of my primary res recommendations is that a greater proportion of any new public and private expenditure be spent on proven early intervention policies. That, one, that just means once it works somewhere. That is, bet that what works will work here. Well, what works for him is just what's worked somewhere. So you see the slide. Okay, and here are Alan's recommendations uh, for deciding what works. Uh, one, up there under good research, um, one randomized controlled trial, and best, there are RCTs, Okay, so those are his standards for what works. And those are standards that are appropriate to show that it works somewhere. Um, he's now putting those as standards for it works and recommending that, that we assume that it will work here. 
This easy slide from 1 to 3 is widespread. There's a U.S. example. Of 1 to 3, just so you see which is 1 to 3. It works, one is, it works somewhere in 3, it will work here. Here's a U.S. example. Um, the Child Welfare League of America, which promotes the implementation, that's 3. It will work here. Of programs that are well evaluated, that's 1. It works somewhere. <coughs> Large picture. And here are the Child Welfare League standards. Okay. Again, what we see is um, that randomized controlled trials are what um, it counts as uh, establishing what works. The injunction to use what works is endemic. The same conflations of the three distinct kinds of causal claims also hide under the expression best practices as well. Consider your own. Canada's Center of Excellence for Child Welfare, which by its own description plays a significant role in promoting best practices among those uh, in the field of child welfare, child rights, children, and young mental health and youth justice. Here's a slide uh, from an important conference they were at. Um, their plenary session at an international conference on the global campaign for violence for debt prevention. There we've got um, that they're interested in um, underscoring what works. Here's another Canadian example, though this is about migrant farm laborers, not about uh, child welfare. Now, before my very brief conclusion, I should like to recall where we started. I began with some policy prescriptions, and they're, they're typical. They're not, um, I mean, I've been focusing on child welfare as an example, but um, you know, to make it vivid, but they're typical. So I began with some policy prescriptions that may be all right, but that certainly call for moral scrutiny. That's why I think it's particularly important here at the Rotman Institute that we look at these kinds of issues, uh, methodological and value issues, um, in, in a united way. Um, so I began uh, with some policy prescriptions that may be all right, but that certainly call for moral scrutiny. My concerns have been about how these prescriptions get supported by a set of dodgy views about certainty objectivity and causality. At the close, we have seen that these are who I predict is about to win the Nobel Prize for her work. As MIT described it, uh, at the time of Duflo's Clark Award, her work uses randomized field experiments to identify highly specific programs. She uses RCTs to identify highly specific programs that can alleviate poverty. Well, randomized experiments can be evidence that a specific program will alleviate poverty, but only if my three conditions are met. <coughs> Facts that make one evidence for three, causal principles that govern the outcome of the study are the same as those that do so here, and that usually means the underlying social structure is the same, there's a good distribution of support factors, and the policy variables here instantiate the concepts figuring in the causal principles shared in the study. Uh, so I'm about to conclude then to say, as Duflo does, and many others as well, that randomized experiments identify programs that can alleviate poverty is loose talk, conflating different kinds of causal claims and giving a false sense of certainty and a false pride that our predictions are objective. The same thing happens in child welfare, in crime prevention, education, and drug abuse. In conclusion, we cannot afford to indulge in loose talk. We need to be clear exactly what it takes to provide reasonable confidence about our policy predictions. Otherwise, we bank too much on the results and disastrous consequences can fall. <coughs> My parting thought to leave with you is that now, as then, we must take seriously the World War II slogan that loose talk can cost lives. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy, for a wonderful and entirely appropriate talk. We have two uh, microphones, one here at the front of the room and one toward the back. If you raise your hands, we'll take turns uh, bringing the microphone to people. Okay, who'd like to go first? Oh, okay. Uh, I have a loud voice. That's okay, we have rules. Rules, rules. All those people who are watching, <laughs> 
<laughs> um, I was interested in, in uh, you use the, does it work here? And the emphasis would seem to be on here. And, uh, but I was uh, struck with how many people use does it work? with the emphasis on work. And I wondered if, uh, if there's something uh, going on. There's a whole lot of people sort of fed up with social theory of some sort or other, and they're, and they're trying to be super practical. Is there anything like that going on in, yes. in this? Yes. Um, uh, sorry. If you read, the, for instance, um, the latest is uh, this big movement in development economics, but this is throughout the evidence-based policy movement. Um, it's that um, we've got too many failed policies, we've been wasting our money, um, development outcomes, uh, the results of well-intentioned programs are not working, so we should get down to some, uh, let's not rely on theory, or the, the general evidence-based policy says not rely on theory or whim, uh, or um, self-interest, or interested, um, but in the development community, it's uh, let's not rely on these kind of loose theories or loose ideas about what will work. Let's find out what works. So <coughs> um, he's in development economics, and when he talks, when I first heard him talking about it at a, at a big lecture, he said, "What are telling you? These are the good guys. I mean, these people really, really do care about development outcomes, and they under, they go to the countries and they work, you know, deeply in the countries. So um, they." And they are really interested in, in practice. What mm -hmm. I just find is that um, you can't do what they like to do with the tools they've got. Right. Thanks. Uh, yes. Thanks again. Great talk. Um, so, on this um, idea of loose talk, I was wondering if. Um, some, if you would have a response to uh, this sort of devil's advocate position that says um, this isn't really a problem if we have loose talk when we're talking about what works in these different scenarios because in policy we're dealing with uncertainty all the time uh, so we don't need uh, something that works in all cases necessarily it's just uh, more of a pragmatic way of talking about what has worked and uh, if we have to go with what we have, uh, we mm -hmm. might say that this works. And instead, um, perhaps um, there is a problem with um, loose talk with relation to uh, the idea of certainty and an expectation for certainty because um, a policy a policymaker might say, we have to be certain about something in order to implement this policy. But that would be a much looser talk uh, of, of the notion of certainty than um, a sort of philosophical uh, idea of certainty. So, so maybe the, um, the demand for certainty is employing uh, too much of a loose talk of this um, idea of certainty, and it's not so much a problem in terms of what works. Okay. Um, so let me start uh, at the beginning. Oh, the it's clearly a good idea to um, have evidence that a policies work somewhere. So, you know, there's this big discussion in the United States about doing medical testing on subjects because um, women feel they haven't been su su significantly represented in the studies. Um, certain ethnic and, and racial minorities feel they aren't appropriately represented in the studies. Um, and, um, but um, one of the... Um, one of the opponents to doing that, or doing it too quickly, said, let's, let's find out at least if it works on someone before we worry about the details of who it works on. Well, that's fine. I think it's really important to, to find out that it works on someone. And you don't have to establish that it works on everyone or widely, but I do think that if you're going to use evidence about what happened in some Indian villages in um, Bangladesh or uh, one of my examples is a, the, a nutrition study in Tamil Nadu that was exported to Bangladesh, and it got worked here and didn't work there. So I think that you, um, it's a good starting point to know it worked somewhere, but it's not, it really isn't talk to use the term it works, uh, unless there's some 
really good additional reason to think it'll travel from there to here. And I don't think that the, it looks to me as if what's going on in these cases is the fallback position is unless we have some fairly apparent reason for thinking it won't, you know, this is pretty compelling evidence that it will, don't put all that, you know, again, let's not be, they tend to, Tony Blair's very loose about certainty, we know we need to be, and we need to accuse um, RCT advocates of being, uh, so they don't think it's certain, and let's not put all our eggs in this basket, because nothing is certain, and of course it's dicey whether it will travel, but it seems to be a fallback position that things will um, travel un unless you've got a specific reason to think they don't. Um, whereas I think we have real philosophical reason for not allowing that as a fallback position. When I want to take a fallback position that it won't travel, <laughs> my fallback position is you should have arguments. And when you don't have arguments, then you should realize how very dicey your, um, your proposed policy is. Um, so, if I have a follow-up, yeah, sure. I was just um, wondering if this maybe sets the standards a little too high because uh, it seems like in any in any policy case, there will probably be some amount of uncertainty. So, um, is there a way we can come up with, a, or a particular case in which um, we can say it works and, and we would be justified in saying that um, in order to implement the policy? Well, um, I really like, uh, I think gravity works. Uh, and we're justified in, in implementing policies uh, on the basis of that. I think the law of the lever works, uh, and I ride my bicycle all the time, and I, a, a, a lot of other, uh, uh, prop up a car with a uh, jack when I want to change the tire. Um, so uh, there are a lot of things that I think we are justified in saying it works. I don't think any of the things that I'm, I feel justified in saying it works, I'm justified <coughs> on the basis of one, two, a handful, a dozen, three dozen experiments. Um, it's not the way it works. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the way. <laughs> it's not the way. Um, it's not the way supporting theory. <coughs> It's not the best way to support theory. Now, if all you have is one, two, three, or a dozen <coughs> experiments, uh, of course you want to act. Um, then you, you have, it's, it's just like, um, what do I say? It's, you have to act all the time, but you shouldn't be pseudo-rational about it. I mean, this is uncertain. It's really uncertain. The fact that you've got a dozen experiments doesn't shouldn't give you a false sense of certainty. So you have to act under uncertainty and full recognition of how much uncertainty you're acting under. So it's not that um, it's not that you shouldn't do anything. Um, and if this is the best you have, there are a lot of considerations I would take into account. Like how costly is it if, you go, if it goes wrong? What are the other options? Are there other problems we could be uh, uh, do, uh, Popper's view? Or, so, piecemeal social planning? Are there other problems that are equally pressing that we have better evidence that if we put our money into them following proposed policies, we'll get results, etc. So, um, thank you. We have a question back here. Yeah. Um, well, I think there are lots of physics examples. So you want a social policy example? Um, I think the, um, some of the things for the nurse family partnership, people, well, I'm sorry, let me back up. The general view um, that I would support and that uh, Deacon supports, that's this comment saying is Deacon, um, is that uh, what you want to do is to understand the, he uses the term mechanism. I don't use it because, you know, we philosophers have at least 16 senses of the term mechanism uh, going around. And he thinks that um, we want to understand the underlying mechanism. And he's got lots of economic examples where he thinks that, at least for the nonce, the underlying um, economic mechanisms are fairly well understood. So he talks about some examples, he used as an example for me, um, whether you can build uh, stations, train stations, you know, train lines in um, China are going to increase economic activity, where you understand fairly well how it would happen um, you understand the underlying structure that would allow it to happen. Um, you've got good 
um, econometric studies in other places that putting in train lines will um, increase economic activity. Um, but we, it's partly because he understands how it does it, not just not just the steps in the causal process, but what's the whole underlying economic social structure that allows that causal principle to hold. Um, so I think there are cases. Um, so the Nurse Family Partnership, which has um, been tried out in a number of American, different American cities. Um, also, um, there we have some idea already of what some of the relevant helping factors might be and also what some of the some symptomatic variables of difference in so relevant difference in social underlying social structure would be. So it's been tested across a number of such variables. Um, uh, and there's some theory and it seems to be working in Birmingham in Birmingham, England where it's been taken up. Um, but all that's a bit dicey because um, that it's not that one understands one of the underlying social structure. It's that we've got some symptomatic variables. And so you look to see uh, urban versus rural, um, whether the neighborhoods it's been tried in are ethnically, racially, culturally, <coughs> which is sort of homogeneous, and sort of indicator variables like that that you think are symptomatic of differences, what might be relevant to the relevant social structure. But if you've got, if you've got any... Um, Good examples uh, where you think uh, you know, um, I should be looking at nice successes that would be good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm just wondering, do you think that those conditions um, apply to um, every part of social policy, or might there be um, some sort of social policy that uh, would require you to alter the conditions? Of just the problem you Oh, I think. I, I, I think the reason for the um, sorry. I think the reason for studying social structure. So I've done this for years, been advocating something I call the underlying nomological machine, and um, it's one reason why the surface. And I really want to understand mechanisms in the more the sense of the underlying machine that allows you when you put your four quarters in to get out the coke tin. I want to know the structure on the inside in order right, to make it better. So I think that you usually um, uh, would be better. That's why that's what the systems theory people were saying in those <coughs> and, uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences documents. Um, it's important to understand the, the, the underlying structural structural arrangements in order to change them rather than change it, trying to tinker with um, the causes at the, at the superficial level. Amy. Um, thank you for your talk. I thought it was really interesting. And I have a, a question regarding um, your third point, the it works here point. And I'm curious about how, when you're answering the it, when we're trying to figure out the answers to the it works here question, to what extent should it um, say people who are involved in the local context for which a policy is you might be dry, trying to generate diplomacy. Um, to what extent do you think they should be involved in the creation of the policy? And I ask because you seem to be putting a lot of emphasis on helping factors and underlying causal structure. And it seems as though that kind of local personal knowledge that you could get from living in that situation. And I mean, it's really broad, so I'm sure it varies case to case, but that having this inclusionary element to the policy um, generation procedure. It seems that it might be wrong. Yes, and the local um, yes. people who are are keen on local knowledge and trying to uh, discuss uh, a local example in Britain that we use, uh, by, uh, Jeremy Hardy and I use in this pamphlet we're writing at Britain about evidence based policy is a microfinance. And uh, he was part of a uh, a charity that did a microfinance project in London. And the idea was uh, they were moved by things like a woman reporting that she and her daughter uh, lived in a neighborhood that had a substantial uh, white population, but all the, in London, but all the hairdressers in the neighborhood were hairdressers for black hair, hair of black people, right? 
uh, which is um, just requires different expertise. Um, and they wanted to open a hairdresser, and both of them weren't trained, uh, but they didn't have any capital. And they only needed a little money. And that's the kind of case that it looks like microfinance is intended for. So they did this project of microfinance in London, and it was a total flop. And microfinance has worked, what worked in various places. It's also failed in various, but it worked in various places. And Jeremy's um, <coughs> analysis is that the people who were recommending it were experts in economics and in world microfinance <laughs> theory, <laughs> the, the, the story behind microfinance. And they didn't pay any attention to London, and we didn't pay attention to the local circumstances, where um, in London it's you know this dreadful thing you can get you can get a credit card for with nothing <laughs> and you can run up ten thousand pounds you can get various credit cards and run up ten thousand pounds of debt on any of them so it's very easy to get credit it's also um, most people are embedded in a slightly larger family network where money is available etc so that's not that's not put in um, so that's one thing the other is that you know that um, there's a widespread movement to think that it's very important that, um, that we stop having this idea that there's one group who has the money and thinks about what policies would be good for another, and that we want people to be real participants in the things that are affecting their lives, not just because that stops a kind of paternalism, um, but also because if you don't own the project, it's very unlikely that the locals fit. So there's that aspect, which is integrated with Again, those are value issues, but then there's the epistemic methodological issue that you, there's local information that are value issues but then there's the to think about. It. And of course, if the local, you know, it's not like the local, locals are, are epistemically privileged because if you don't understand how it's supposed to work, then you don't know what's locally going to get in the way of it working. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Eric. So uh, your your answers your answers to the um, last couple of questions um, may suggest uh, grounds for pessimism about the effect of uh, the effectiveness of policy in general. Um, if you accept your uh, your arguments face forward, the problem is that so uh, to compare the situation in physics, one of the one of the most peculiar to me, it's one of the most peculiar and uh, and surprising things about physics as a science is that one can, in fact, very often, when using a physical theory to model a particular kind of system or for a particular token of a physical system, one can rely on well-entrenched, well-established physical principles, part of the theory itself, to justify ignoring various aspects of the system in, in modeling. One can you know, say, well, I'm, I'm going to treat it as a sphere, and I'm going to ignore air resistance and that kind of sort of thing, and you can actually give very powerful, you know, good, physical theory, you know, good physical reasons based on entrenched theory to show why, for the purposes of your investigation, the kinds of approximations, what you're ignoring, are in fact, it's justified to do so, and you will get, a, and you will get, you have confidence that you will get a good answer. To the best of my knowledge, in most of the most of social sciences, that is never the case. One, that one doesn't have well-entrenched theory yeah. that one can use to justify ignoring this or that factor. In fact, it's almost always the opposite case, that one has to work on a case-by-case -case basis to figure out what the relevant factors are and try and, and move from there to, to a little a, a slightly more general theoretical statement, but that one, one still really has no confidence at all in extending to new cases from you know, it works here to it works there. So it, um, if, if that really is the epistemic situation for most of the social sciences, that one doesn't have available strong, strong entrenched principles that allow me to say, given a general situation, to give an argument for why certain kinds of approximations ignoring certain factors are it will be a good will be a good approximation across the board, and given your I think compelling argument that we need to uh, to worry about the slide from it works to you know, it works there to it works here, um, it, should we ever have comp should we ever think that uh, any kind of study of this sort is going to provide evidence for its working here without say the kind of detailed local knowledge that any of us perhaps referring to. Or, some, or something else of the sort. Well, I think the less you know, uh, the dicier your, your predictions will be. Um, that doesn't mean that you should make predictions. But one of the things, one of the reasons I got 
I was halfway launched in this. Um, and I went to a, a, a seminar at the home office, and the government social scientist said, well, you know, what's happened, this was under the um, Labour government, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, who were very committed to evidence-based policy. And um, then this social science uh, advisor of the government social scientist said, um, I think I'm talk talking out of school, but what he said was, um, sorry, I shouldn't have I, I But I remember being told, but people in the, um, in the home office and widely through the government, which they would never seen other social scientists. Um, why? Well, because what happened was that um, there was a big wave of quite a genuine, I think, of honest enthusiasm for evidence-based policy. And after a decade, and we didn't, things weren't all that much better. <laughs> um, and um, that then there the, the must be, a, a, what do you call it, a backswing. Um, uh, uh, say, well, let's not bother with it. It like, didn't do any good. Um, whereas it seems to me that um, that's the wrong thing. It's the, let's do it a little better and let's realize that there are, um, that's not as Blair. When you heard him say, we can be certain. Well, that was that was the mistake, right? Um, to expect <coughs> too much, way too soon, and way too cheap. But um, of course, in your government, you have to make short decisions quickly, um, and unfortunately, you want short-term outcomes because otherwise, you don't get reelected and people don't see the results. So, but, um, the problem is a failure because the market is <laughs> still in a bit of a mess. Um, but that's that's the standard. Um, so, yes, we have all these problems, um, but it's better to use what information you can get to think about um, whether the whole, the, what kinds of things, um, and to know what kind of information you need. That's the job I've been doing, is to try and isolate, although I do it at a very abstract level, what kind of information you need. Everyone knows you need some, you know, we need to know more. There's a problem with external validity. Well, there's a problem. How come these slides are easily from one to the other? Or also attuned to this problem? And then, you know, what, at, at, at even an abstract level, what kind of further information do you need? You lay it out, then you can start hunting for it. Bill Harper has the next question. Okay. Uh, I think. Uh, from uh, Angus, who believes that there are some. 
for the nonce at least, you could buy this story about the, about the mechanisms. Um, the nurse family partnership <coughs> is um, nice because one of the things that uh, we talked about last uh, yesterday uh, and that comes up today is um, this demand that you stick to the protocol. So you've got a policy that's worked somewhere. Because probably the protocols uh, described at a very low economy. It may well be at too operationalized a level. Now, um, the opposite problem to that, so I'm going to try to get to the point. The opposite problem to that is cherry picking. So what people would, what people do I mean, in not sticking to the protocol is often to look at some aspects of the program that succeeded somewhere and hope that they could just do the cheap things and get the result. And so people who develop programs and um, don't want to see them accused of being bad programs and failed programs want you to stick to the protocol so you don't cherry pick for the cheap ones. So you've got something we can do. Now, the reason the, the, the thing about the nurse family partnership, as I understand it, is that it's fairly elaborate. And it's at both a fairly operationalized and a fairly abstract level. And um, apparently, as it's being operationalized, um, so it's still being kind of operationalized in Britain, so that you know, change it, telling you fairly specifically what you have to do. But it's being changed from the way it's been done in the US. So there's a case where it's the um, project itself has got so much sort of structure in the intervention <laughs> um, that um, it almost carries it, it almost carries its social structure, it hopes to carry a lot of its social structure with it, but there's also a lot of hands-on attempt to understand what these abstract concepts really amount to in these different settings. And so that is in the course of the implementation to inform those applications, that would be, if that's, that would be an example of your thing that you help in that work. Yes. Right. yes. 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 Um, so the, um, so, well that's, let me, one of the problems is, um, I think you have this problem in general with um, moving from, say, an economic model or an economic experiment, is if you look at an economic model, uh, it's the same thing going on, but I just thought it might be an easier example. Um, you, um, in the economic model, like, say, Schelling's discriminate, checkerboard discrimination model, you derive something very concrete. You actually derive that the black checkers will clump together and the white checkers will clump together under this funny rule about how you, they move around the board. Um, from that, you conclude something abstract about preferences uh, for racial to live in uh, and, and, and uh, uh, segregation. Then you go to a, new, a real case and you have to figure out what think those abstract terms like preference not to live in a segregated neighborhood mean over here. And there's several steps involved. One was how did you know from sort of story about checkers why did you conclude something about segregation and people's preferences? And checkers don't have preferences. Right? How, do they, how do they get in? So uh, there's a lot of theory involved when you go from the experiment, and in this case it's a, a pen and paper experiment, um, the thought experiment, you go, the thought experiment. <laughs> um, you go from the thought experiment, uh, you draw a conclusion is the right one, and that comes from somewhere else. Um, that, that's the right way to conceptualize the result. And then you come over here to a new case. Uh, that was not, I didn't choose a one that seems particularly hard when you've got the word preferences. They all think we know what preferences are. I don't think we do in a new case, right? But um, when you come to the real case, you have to I call, climb back down the ladder of abstraction. And again, there's, since there's no rules, you have to figure out what instantiates the abstract concepts in the new place. Um, um, where is that well done? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, I think it's uh, might be well done in the nurse family partnership. Um, I think that you see people thinking about it. In this case, I raised um, <coughs> child welfare and making fathers go to parenting classes. 
I mean, that just came out of discussions with Eileen Monroe, who was discussing with other social workers, and there um, they know what the abstract theory is. You know, parenting classes are going to inform, etc. So they've got the abstract theory, and they are there's a, there's a, in a sense a successful case because they're alerted to the issue. They wouldn't, just, they wouldn't have described it the way I did with the ladders and everything, but um, they, they're alerted to the issue and are thinking about it and then trying to investigate um, whether, yeah. Are there any further questions? Um, so, so I've been thinking about whether, how much of the problem has to do with people wanting these uh, things that work everywhere and sort of universal, universality um, in matters that are uh, so complex that, that that's hard to achieve. Now, what you've been describing, as I understand it, is universality is the, the right way to think about it, which is to look at this more abstract level and, and expect <coughs> complex interactions everywhere. But still, what, you, what, what we're after is understanding all of that stuff well enough that ultimately we'll, we'll, we'll be able to get this other kind of universality. So, this, so, so <laughs> hang on to that for a minute. Um, uh, the, the, so the question is whether, whether there might be a different approach that's, that's more pragmatic, maybe, which is not to try to get things that work even at this more abstract, more, uh, much more informed level, but to try to get something that works here, and something that works here, and something that works here, and something that works here. And there's no reason that we should, that they should be the same at any level of description. And there's no reason that we even really have to understand how they're related to each other. We just need them. Yes? Um, so. Uh, I agree with that. That would be a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, it's that people want some guidance for how to... Indeed. How are we going to uh, deal with uh, problem families and abused children here in London or there in Birmingham or um, there in London, England? So, um, looking for some guidance from yeah. um, science, yeah. this movement has said, let's start with finding out that, uh, that a policy works at least somewhere. Yeah. That's what the U.S. Department of Education says. Um, you should you shouldn't be investing in it if it's never worked anywhere. And you can see the, the yeah. talk there. Yeah. Uh, and I actually think that's a mistake because I think we sometimes throw out the programs. I think that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking was that it seems to me that all over the place it happens that you've got something that's working very locally, a school that's just thriving sort of mysteriously up, that's not on the basis of research that comes from someplace else. Um, uh, and that it's possible to have a policy response to those cases that says, take what's you know, take what's working locally, and try to spread it a little bit um, instead of trying to find something, some single president. Well, I'm I'm personally sympathetic with that because I'm um, I'm an epistemic conservative and I like to take little steps. And that's how I got to say the laws of physics. And I thought the laws of physics were absolutely admirable and did wonderful things for us. Um, but they were so far away from what I thought by little steps um, you were actually had warrant for, as opposed to um, giving one of the organizing thing for you. Were <coughs> um, there are more detailed versions in the hands of, say, laser physicists <laughs> um, would, um, would be immediately helpful. Um, so, but um, there, there are these opposite metaphysical views that if, it, it, if something is actually producing a result, it has to be because of something generalizable. Um, and I don't want to deny that, but I do want to point out the dangers. Um, I mean, another thing we didn't uh, talk about, but this thing about the steps. Um, it, uh, in the Bill Goldberg machine, every, you, you know, every step is guaranteed by something which is generalizable, widely generalizable, 
but the way the steps are connected with each other depends entirely on the local structure. Um, so the fact that cause one at the abstract level isn't a cause at, the, at that level, it's because this effect, the first effect instantiates just the more abstract effect concept here, and it instantiates the more abstract cause concept there. Is that too complicated? Yeah, anyway, you see the idea. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> I, I, I do really worry about the drawing for generalizability when you want to figure out how to make something work, um, as opposed to wanting to have the tools to build models that will... Um, I mean, we, we have all those nice tools, the laws of the lever and the laws of the pulley, uh, that allow Luke Goldberg to build that very um, nice machine with this very, very odd cause of principle. Um, so we do want to pay some attention to the generalizable principles, but they're not likely. My feeling is I would put many eggs in the basket of thinking those generalizable principles are going to be ones that connect the causes and effects we're interested in. We're going to have, I mean, they're going to be pretty far away and you have to deploy them um, in, a, in, a, in a complicated way to produce the results. Um, but anyway, I hope that I mean, what I really wanted to do was in, in this lecture was not just to talk about the specifics, but uh, I think that these cases are cases where it's it's impossible to deal with the ethical issues independently of the methodological issues. So that we need methodologists, people thinking about the methodology and the ethics of the policies. Uh, in the same conversation at the same time. I think of a better note on which to end, so thank you. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Oh, and the highly cherished philosophy mug. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It worked. <laughs>